So the next speaker is Alessandro Tavano from the Max Planck Institute for Empirical Aesthetics in Frankfurt. And he'll tell us about internal rhythms to sentences. If we can please have your attention. Thank you. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me. Uh, it's, um, it's really a privilege. Uh, it's a privilege because uh, I just got into the field, so I am actually humbly trying to show you what I have been doing uh, up to now. And uh, my main goal for today is to uh, put um, a tiny leaf on top of a nice uh, syntactic tree and see at which frequency it vibrates. So, um, We've been using, and we, and I will show you data, uh, the frequency tagging approach for uh, many reasons. So the frequency tagging approach is such, the main assumption is you stimulate the brain with some stimuli at a given frequency, and the idea is that the neuronal assemblies that are coding actually for that stimulus would uh, oscillate at that frequency too. And um, one of the main uh, reasons why we do this is because uh, this way we can get a higher signal noise ratio uh, with respect for example to averaging and so we can see in this case that um, in the original signal there is there are two main components actually dominating the other reason as I said is that we can actually see um, something going on very specifically which is stimulus specific. For example, if you have uh, a face that appears uh, with uh, a specific rhythm, then you can also as well do the simple FFT transformation and you will see uh, a response that is that runs at the frequency that you deliver the stimulus at and that this response is effectively stimulus specific because, for example, it can distinguish between uh, standard deviant in, in, uh, as in we show in this case. So uh, one thing that we could do at this point is to tag speech and uh, uh, we can, for example, start by putting together words and seeing what's happening and then uh, we can see also what's happening at the higher level. Uh, we could do it uh, visually, but actually we are more interested in the spoken counterpart of language and um, we're more interested in this because uh, language or speech in language actually um, appear or are are delivered at uh, different time scales, and uh, if we look at larger constituents, which is what we will, um, what I will try to show you today, um, the uh, frequencies at which we uh, would likely, um, uh, which we would likely concentrate on, would be uh, here what originally was defined stimulus-induced theta oscillations between one and eight hertz. So um, this uh, later on was uh, revaluated, and um, and uh, you know that model, that model, you can uh, distinguish the theta doing uh, the um, uh, segmentation uh, component between three and nine, and then you have the delta below at three or below three, and uh, we know that for these uh, low frequencies, um, they actually can entrain or to the um, slow fluctuations of the uh, energy. In the stimuli, in the speech stimuli, but um, as Nai um, and Elana showed, um, we are more interested in uh, understanding whether we can go beyond the uh, purely acoustics. So um, Nai did this, uh, this great study uh, where I'll start now to use a few uh, linguistic terms um, so that gradually you are um, uh, you use repetition suppression to be less uh, to be used to it. So um, we have sentences composed of one noun phrase and one verb phrase, and this structure uh, repeats in time many times, up to 10, 10 times for one trial. And when you do the FFT, you see obviously the uh, stimulation frequency. It says the frequency of the syllable because each word is actually monosyllabic. And, but you also see the frequency of the sentence and you see what is interpreted as the frequency of the phrase. And uh, the conclusion is that the brain um, entrains to the stimulation, or syllabic stimulation in this case, or word uh, simulation, uh, which is regular at 250 milliseconds. But with this trick, regularizing uh, or isochronizing speech, we can also see that the brain entrains to um, information that is uh, actually not in the stimuli at all. 
So um, Nai used uh, stimuli with, um, uh, in Chinese and also in English. In English, you can see the same thing. So if what you deliver is individual words that are not connected, then you obtain only the syllabic or word level response. But if the words connect in phrases and sentences, then you obtain the sentence rate and the uh, phrase rate. This is all nice. Um, you can see maybe there is something going on here, uh, but the idea is that we get a scale that relates to um, the construction, the internal structure, not only to the higher node, but also to the internal structure of the stimuli that we deliver. And our point was actually whether um, these low frequency brain rhythms are also sensitive to changes in phrase structure. So if we make the stimuli a bit more com complex, what's happening? And so this is one, the first um, thing that we do, or just an example of what we do. So we have a replication of the stimuli uh, from night. There is a sentence, and then a noun phrase, and a verb phrase. The noun phrase uh, then uh, refers to a determiner, a noun, and the verb refers to a verb and an adjective. So for example, mein Schrank ist alt, which is my cabinet, I think, uh, is old. Um, you can have a sentence that is still four words, so, from a word perspective, it's the same sentence, but actually the structure is very different. There's still a higher node, which is a sentence, but the noun phrase in this case is just the noun, so it's one element constitutes the noun phrase, and the verb phrase is internally complex. There is a verb, and then there is a second embedded noun phrase. So, at a word level, or since we're using monosyllabic words at a syllabic level, uh, they are the same, but the internal structure is different. So, again, this is what this is the first uh, pair or couple of conditions that we will uh, use. I will show you uh, the structure for eight conditions because we um, wanted to test uh, uh, different behaviors. So each word is running at four hertz, and then this is the internal structure condition A and B. And then we have condition C and D. So condition C is a different um, replication of condition B. So the noun phrase is still one word. And the verb phrase, instead of having a second noun phrase, as an adjectival phrase. The condition D is the mirror, at least from a structural viewpoint at the level of phrases, of condition D. We have conditions E and F. In this case, we uh, applied a crucial uh, manipulation. So up to now, we have been um, exposed to results uh, where uh, a word is running at 250 milliseconds and the sentence itself is running at one hertz. In this case, though, we have five words that constitute the first sentence. The noun phrase has three words and the verb phrase two. And in the AF condition, it's just the mirror uh, condition. So the noun phrase is two words, and the verb phrase is three words. And the crucial manipulation is the following, that we have five words to complete a sentence. So this means that the integration rhythm cannot be one hertz, but it must be 0 0.8 hertz. And then to see a little bit more what's going on um, below one hertz, um, we had also condition G versus, versus H, and in this case, it's the same as E versus F, but instead of having monosyllabic words, we have disyllabic words. So each word is composed of two syllables. And so it's the same structure. Three uh, elements constitute the noun phrase and two the verb phrase for G, and the mirror image for H. Here, although, since the... Um, uh, individual words are disyllabic, we need to run slower. So the stimulation, the difference is that the stimulation is at 2 hertz. Um, it's important to um, have a look, although brief, at the, how we constructed the materials. So as uh, um, 
and I suggested we created the individual words with a text-to-speech synthesizer uh, to prevent prosodic uh, um, uh, co-articulations or co-articulation effects from prosodic. Um, but we also um, flattened the pitch of each individual word, so pitch cannot be um, an indication of prosodic structure. You'll see this creates a, a slightly um, robotic voice, but it's still well understandable by um, uh, German native speakers. And uh, another thing that we did, uh, um, in, we uh, wanted to be 100% sure that a low level uh, information could not determine what we find uh, um, and that we would tag as high level. And uh, for this reason, what we, we run uh, in using Celex, an analysis for each condition of the uh, bifone transi tran uh, transitional probabilities between and within um, boundaries, phrase boundaries. Between means um, the transitional probability, for example, between mine and shrunk, and between ist and alt. This is within a phrase. And between is the probability between shrunk and ist. So what we wanted to be sure is that uh, there was no uh, effect of boundary and there was especially no uh, interaction of boundary with condition. And we find, of course, differences between conditions because the conditions are structurally uh, either longer or shorter, um, but we find no significant effect of boundary. So from a low level, by phone to by phone, transitional probability, we are fine. Um, this is a stress structure that we used. It's very simple and it replicates exactly what Nye used. So we had um, a series of uh, sentences linked one after the other uh, with no gap, so without solution of continuity. And the regular trials in this case are uh, quite a uh, consistent number, it's 42. And uh, each um, trial uh, was uh, composed of 10 sentences. And then we had participants detect in uh, a few trials, like 16% of the remaining ones, which, in which case there was, uh, in which trials, the sentences were actually ungrammatical. Uh, so for example, here uh, you have a verb followed by a determiner, an adjective, and a noun. That cannot build up a sentence in any way. So, and, and number, position number four as well. So participants would uh, press a button to uh, uh, this odd trial after the trial is finished. Um, so I would like to play a little video for you and the video will uh, illustrate the um, sound stimulation that we have, the acoustic stimulation, for bef uh, at the beginning for conditions A versus B, and then for conditions E versus F. So you don't need to remember the, the, the names, so I will show you. Um, this way you can have a look at what will later turn out to be the crucial conditions. I hope the sound works. Mein Pferd ist braun, ihr Kind war krank, dein Tee wird kalt, ihr Kleid ist eng, mein Rock war kurz. Pretty fast. Sie wirft den Stein, ich mag kein Brot, er will mein Geld, sie hat ein Pferd, er streicht sein Boot. And now E. Milch im Glas bleibt frisch, Wurst mit Kraut macht stark Wein aus, meins riecht gut, Fritz aus Trier wird kahl, Glück im Spiel ist toll. Mein Ei ist fast gar, mein Chef war sehr streng, kein Schnaps ist zu stark, ihr Buch ist recht gut, viel Geld macht sehr reich. So as you see, it's pretty well controlled. Okay, so what are our predictions or our expectations? So basically, um, we, if there is no entrainment to sentences, uh, we expect simply um, an effect at the frequency that we stimulate at, in this case, at the stimulation of four. But if we, oops, all right. But if we have, um, yeah, but if we have um, a construction that can, or the, the creation, the internal creation of a rhythm that has to do with the sentence, then we should find something, uh, some activity ringing at one hertz. These are the basic um, uh, outcomes that we would expect. 
And here is what we find. So first of all, um, um, it's native, uh, native speakers of German. So it's, uh, although for non-native speakers, the stimuli that I played um, may have sound very complicated. Actually, the uh, behavior was really consistently high. Um, this is also helped by the fact that we that is an oddball structure. So uh, measures like the prime are inflated. But as I'll show you later, we also have um, uh, confirmation from 50-50 um, uh, distribution. So the important thing here is, so for the um, uh, structures A and B running at 4 hertz, uh, we find actually no difference. We find, first of all, the stimulation frequency and then the sentence frequency, which are both significant. But um, we find that also um, a, a 2 hertz uh, frequency is represented and a 3 hertz rhythm is also represented. Um, this is, um, is a result that um, it's a bit new with respect to uh, the data of Nye. And for... Um, the conditions C and D, which were a bit more difficult, as you see from the D primes, still we find a very good uh, stimulation frequency, the ringing at sentence frequency, and uh, the harmonics. The three is the same in both, and is significant in condition D for two. Um, there is a variability in, in um, subject by subject in which conditions we can find these bumps. So from this perspective, what seems to be the case is that we have um, uh, a ringing or of the uh, stimulation frequency at one hertz uh, that then goes at two hertz and three hertz. So in my view, this suggests that um, uh, the stimulation frequency uh, could uh, uh, actually be um, creating harmonics, an harmonic structure. However, um, these um, conditions are not so telling because in, this, uh, in these conditions, the one hertz could still come from a, like a subharmonic of the four as well, and the two as well could be a subharmonic of the four. So the only discriminant difference, uh, the only discriminant information is the three hertz, which cannot be a subharmonic of four, but can be an harmonic of one. So, um, now I'm going to show you why the next conditions where we have five words are actually uh, interesting. And they are interesting because here too you have a significant um, uh, harmonic structure. Um, the stimulation frequency is at 4 hertz and the sentence frequency is at 0 0.0 hertz. But then crucially the harmonic is at 1.6 and 2.4 and even a little bit 3.2. And these harmonics cannot come from the stimulation frequency, by definition. So they must be harmonics of the uh, sentence rhythm, the internal sentence rhythm. And the same goes for the disyllabic. Um, for the disyllabic uh, conditions. So as you see here, uh, the original stimuli were running at 2 hertz. And so they create a nice sentence uh, rhythm at 0 0.4 hertz, so similar to what Alana also found at 0 0.5. Um, so we just, uh, we have broken the one hertz barrier in a way. And, um, and the ringing is concurrently then at, uh, consequently at 0 0.8 and 1.2 and perhaps some int at 1.6, but not really. So what seems to be the case, at least from our stimuli, is that, um, the sentence rhythm produces its own harmonics. And um, these harmonics are, so if the sentence rhythm is at one hertz, then uh, the harmonics are at two hertz and three hertz. Here for the A's and the B's, the C's and the D's with some uncertainty. If the sentence rhythm is, is at uh, 0 0.8 hertz or 0 0.4 hertz, then the harmonics are consequently at 1.6, 2.4 or 0 0.8, 1.2. So, uh, from our uh, data, what seems to come up is a harmonic structure. The harmonic structure is informative because uh, it suggests that the sentence frequency is uh, not directly derived as a superharmonic from the stimulation frequency in any case. And if you look at the scalp distributions, one can also see that the sentence um, uh, scalp, the scalp distribution of the sentence response is very similar to the one of the first harmonic, in this case represented, but uh, different with, in, uh, with respect to the potential generators with respect to, uh, as compared to the uh, stimulation frequency. And the same goes on uh, whether you have 
four words as before or five words. Conditions E and F. And if you look at the sound intensity uh, of the stimuli that we give, then you have a huge peak in the um, stimulation at stimulation frequency uh, at the word rate, but nothing else. Then we replicated this data with uh, a slightly, uh, slightly different um, proportion of uh, regular and oddball trials. And um, uh, we still have very good and consistent responses. The sentence frequency, the stimulation frequency, but again, the harmonics. The sentence frequency at 0 0.8, the uh, stimulation frequency at 4, and again, the harmonics. It's a bit more difficult because the signal noise ratio here is less good, as we uh, were coding only half of the available trials, since we were coding the, reg the trials at which participants were pressing the button saying that they were regular, so they were uh, dramatically correct. But uh, it's confirmed in the uh, slow uh, stimulation paradigm, 0 0.4, a very strong 0 0.8 in both conditions, and the classic stimulation frequency. So. Again, as I said, the harmonic structure is what comes out. Uh, although, as I said, the um, uh, signal noise ratio is much lower, but the structure is remarkably similar. And so from this, we conclude that uh, there is definitely cortical entrainment at, uh, to an internal rhythm that is not in the stimuli. And this is a sentence rhythm at slow frequencies below, uh, even at slow frequencies below one hertz. And this, um, the creation or, or the finding that uh, these sentences create their own harmonic structure is very important because it, uh, when uh, appropriately manipulated, the stimuli uh, show that the harmonic structure uh, supports independence of the uh, sentence rhythm, the internal sentence rhythm, from the stimulation frequency. So um, there can be two hypotheses that, um, with respect to why we have an harmonic structure. Uh, one very basic hypothesis is that the uh, encoding of the sinusoid or the internal rhythm uh, of the sentence is uh, imprecise and that would create the harmonics. Or actually that the oscillator that is coding for uh, this internal rhythm is uh, nonlinear and a nonlinear oscillator creates uh, harmonics by definition. Second sum up, uh, the order is a bit weird. So uh, we find no evidence for um, the buildup of internal structure. Uh, this could be, um, I think, one possibility is, um, first of all, uh, the paradigm is um, uh, delivered, so similar delivered in a way that in a blockwise manner, and so participants receive over and over the same stimulus, the same structure. And obviously, the most, uh, uh, from a purely perceptual viewpoint, the most um, reliable structure is the highest one, the one running at slower frequencies, so participants can extract everything once they have the higher structure or they keep going on with the higher structure. And so this would be oh, that uh, anticipation-driven delta from a functional viewpoint. And um, the other uh, possible conclusion is that there is a limit in the type of approach that we take. So uh, when we FFT these long sequences, uh, what we get is we see only what repeats periodically. So I, with this, I would like to thank you for um, listening to my legal um, uh, um, idea of oscillations or of entrainment, and uh, I, I would like to thank my collaborators. Thank you. Okay, we have, we have more than 20 minutes for questions. Have you done an FFT on the stimuli themselves to yes. uh, prove that these harmonics aren't present there? Yes, so it's a bit complicated because, um, so what I did, I looked into um, the different constituents. So sometimes you have three words, sometimes two words. And then what, what is nice is that I see um, a, sli a slightly faster um, uh, rhythm when it's uh, two words. 
than when it's three words, so that's a nice sanity check. But it's a bit difficult for me to, dis to see what it is because, um, because of the simulation that or the number of words that I use. Um, I don't know whether it's simply the harmonic that repeats within the uh, individual phrases or simply the integration across the phrases. It's, it's a bit complicated. So for example, if you have three words, um, uh, the, let's say the precision of the, um, if you have three words running at, at four hertz, you would get uh, 750 milliseconds, right? And so uh, run out of 1,250 milliseconds, and I get something that could be 1.30, 1.6, something in there, in between there. So the precision that I have is not sufficient. We have uh, some pilot data with longer sentences, with longer constituents, and there I think I can see that, what it is. Uh, thanks, Alice. It's a really interesting way to entang disentangle the harmonic structure versus uh, online phrasal building. I was thinking, uh, though, that, uh, as you mentioned, that the FFT will only give you the periodic patterns, right? And so yeah. your phrases in the five set word sentence case are three and two, so it might be harder to find in the FFT. Yeah. So just w uh, one thought about how to get around that right. might be to, you know, now we've, we started at four, went to five, now let's go to six, yeah. right? And then you can have phrases that are either three words long or two yeah. words long. Yeah. And then if it's harmonic structure, it shouldn't matter. It yeah. should be find the same effect. And if it's about phrasal buildup, you'll see that peak at either you know, two or three. Yes. That's, have you that's done that's a thought about Yes, this is the direction that we're going to, to um, see whether the, what, what it is about the harmonic that replicates, yeah. Sorry, Greta and then Nancy? So, Nancy, sorry, there's someone in front of you, sorry. Thank you, sorry. Um, first of all, thanks for the interesting presentation. Um, I was interested in the ungrammatical trials that you included. Um, oh, okay. Did you analyze those? Yes, I, I could analyze them uh, when it's, um, I don't have it, here, I have it here, but I have analyzed them, uh, especially in the second condition, in the second replication experiment, mm -hmm. because we have 25 trials that are um, actually coded as, a, or actually regular, and 25 that are odd or ungrammatical. And um, what I see, I see the structure still there, uh -huh. But it's uh, the peaks are smaller. Ah, oh, interesting. Okay. So I don't know whether it's because uh, attention is driven is taken mm -hmm. away from the stimulation from the training, you know, to the mm -hmm. because the onset of a grammatical sentence is an event. Yeah. It's an mm -hmm. attention capturing event. So it may be that it takes simply away um, uh, from the um, right. uh, attentional um, uh, deployment of inf of uh, uh, resources on the. Uh, rhythm, actually. Because they were basically word lists, right? There was no nothing to build structure from. No, the ungrammatical are contain are actually um, most of them. Most of the sentences are grammatical, but some of them are ungrammatical. So the participants have to pay attention and press that. Okay. We also have a condition where it's only words, like a word salad, uh -huh. and that gives the classic uh, just word frequency. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, Nancy Capels next. Could you pass the microphone, please? Oh, uh, I was interested in a similar point that was just made before about the ambiguity between harmonics and um, and phrasal structure. Yeah. And I agree that it's really important to try to to separate that out. I I would have guessed that the phrasal structure would be more determinative of what you found than harmonics, because harmonics in size tend to go down. And you weren't seeing yes. things like that. Yeah. So, <laughs> so from I, I'm interested in the harmonics uh, uh, because they can actually be a feature and not a bug. So I'm interested in understanding oh, sure, what they mean. And um, but, what but you know, as, as soon as you start having sentences of more variable length, yeah. that goes away. Yeah, yeah, I, I would agree, totally. Um, what is interesting for me is usually that the first harmonic is, is pretty large, 
and second harmonic is small, and this um, uh, is common finding. Uh, um, for example, even when analyzing uh, brainstem data, uh, the for example the, the first harmonic of the uh, line noise <laughs> is very is very strong, and the second goes down. So it's it's so, it's, but that that it's was nice. exactly my point that right. if you're really dealing with harmonics, you expect that each harmonic would go down in power. Yeah. Whereas if you're dealing with something that has an internal structure, like a, a phrasal period, yeah. then you would not expect to see that kind of decrease in harmonic yeah. uh, power. So I think um, another point um, in favor of the analysis that, that this is maybe is, a, I wouldn't say an artifact, but what actually the FFT allows us to see uh, is the fact that um, if we assume that the brain is recognizing the phrases and the, uh, the nature of the phrases, not simply, okay, it's a phrase, but saying, okay, it's a noun phrase, okay, it's a verb phrase, mm -hmm. then... Um, the noun phrase repeats at the same frequency as the sentence, uh -huh. right? Exactly. And the verb right. phrase repeats at the same exactly. frequency as exactly the sentence. Right. And, and, and so the time I, uh, between the beginning and end of the noun phrase right. is always going to stay there, right. and that's what the FFT is picking yeah, up. Yeah, exactly. So it can show us what it can. It's like um, walking down a corridor, and what you can see is the is the um, well, the line of doors. If you want to see more, you have to enter a door uh, or cross a wall if you can. And, um, and then you can see what's in the room, but then you don't see anymore what's outside. More questions? Oh, sorry, it's, oh, it's on now. I wonder whether we can speculate, you know, it seems like a friendly meeting. So in very simple kind of cartoon terms, what it would mean, or like how would a mechanism, an oscillation-based mechanism of hierarchical structure, like how could it look like? So I'm sitting there, you know, the way I tend to think is like in a cartoon way, so I'm the brain, and then I have all those oscillations available, and then I'm just going to throw out a, you know, if like a half, sorry, well, it was four hertz, okay. So like a, an oscillation that corresponds to two word period, you know, so like half, a, uh, sorry, what was it? Two hertz oscillation. Um, and at the same time, I'm gonna throw out like a 1.33 hertz oscillation to capture a phrase that might come out of three words. So basically, I don't I'm, know. <laughs> like, <laughs> That's my I think answer. it's like, I, I'm, I'm, I guess in, you know, trying to show that like, at least in my mind, there is no plausible way of, you know, preparing, being prepared for the lengths of constituent and, you know, changing this all the time because, you know, you don't know what you're preparing for. Um, so do we really think that it's like, you know, hierarchical structure building where those constituent sizes are nowhere, you know, predefinable is so, oscillation based? Um, it's a big question. I don't, I'm not sure if I'm the most qualified person to respond to this, but I, I will tell you what I think it's in my data. And in my data is simply the, what Odette says, possibly, the, the, the fumes of the coding or the transfer of the information at the end that goes on. Uh, this is because uh, of the way that we um, stimulated the brain <laughs> uh, with constantly repeating structure that is always the same besides being as organized. And whether, uh, the, um, when you talk about um, uh, shooting uh, some, some open, or opening a window, mm -hmm. um, we've been uh, talking about this, um, the fact that you open windows of different temporal windows at the same time. So let, let's say a delta window, a theta window, and whatever. And I guess, one guess could be that if there is an oscillation uh, um, or a mechanism helping in, in, in uh, segmentation and then decoding is, um, uh, it comes from the interaction from, of, between these different um, um, levels of uh, uh, temporal analysis. So you can start shooting and, and then what the, the delta and then maybe the theta already ends and it's helping the delta to keep on shooting perhaps. But more than that, it's just speculation. Okay. 
Um, yes. So it's it's a generalization of what you're you're saying. I'm thinking about this. Uh, would you agree with the fact that an, the interesting feature of an oscillator is that you can predict time using the phase? Okay. Yeah. So then that means that to use an oscillator, and even more when you speak about entrainment, considering the definition that we had this morning by Joachim, uh, I think it's interesting whenever you're studying a phenomenon that has a, a, period, a temporal periodicity. That's something that yeah. is predicted. So what she's arguing is that, in a way, if, in, if you have to, to, to use an oscillator to predict the, the beat in music, everyone would agree that that works. Okay, you can do computational modeling, it works. If you're studying syllable levels, then it can sort of work because there is a sort of pseudo rhythmicity in syllable. But then, in terms of, uh, of a syntactic structure, one can really wonder, is, is it really uh, functionally relevant to use, you know, to, 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 to use yeah. an oscillator and to speak about entrainment? For me, personally, and I think that's, that's your point you're making, there's no, uh, there's no relevance because it's not something that, that you can have an advantage in predicting time. On the contrary, I think it's even worse because if you if you predict in time now I'm I'm saying structure subject verb noun and then I change the structure then you you wouldn't be able to follow my talk because you are entrained to the wrong oscillator. Yeah, I, I follow what you say and I agree in general. What I I uh, think I would like to say is that um, anyway I think this approach is uh, extremely uh, could be potentially be potentially be very productive in the following way. So if we assume that, uh, and if we follow uh, nice findings, that uh, if you deliver a series of phrases, what you get is actually the entrainment to the phrase, right? And if you, uh, and if you accept some of uh, my conclusions that if you deliver a higher node, then you get that higher node, because it's always replicating, then a possibility could be that uh, we can see the highest possible node that the brain is in training to, or the brain is, uh, if not in training, the brain is, um, uh, capturing and uh, the rhythm to that and this can be used uh, uh, to study um, in different populations from a developmental perspective or from a, a, even a clinical perspective whether uh, that level of encoding is still preserved for example and from this point of view I think it's an extremely useful uh, tool and it also gives you a great signal noise ratio so um, I like it. Just a quick comment on that. So I don't think that the brain will throw out, I mean, your oscillations at all frequencies at the beginning of a phrase. I think uh, it's not really, I mean, an oscillation at the beginning. It's more like, a, I mean, the ons after the onset of the structure, uh, the neural response will t uh, begin to either maintain a high level of activation or it will drift in one direction. It's more like accumulating information online. It's more like, I mean, the decision variable, I mean, during a decision-making task. And at the boundary of, at the, um, the other boundary of the uh, structure, this response will just reset. So it doesn't really need to start to oscillate at a specific frequency. It will just, I think, drift in one direction until the end of the structure. So this way, we don't really need to figure out how long the phrase is at the beginning of it. Uh, it's not really offset driven, it's more like, I mean, uh, continuous tracking of the structure, not, right. Not necessarily oscillation at the beginning, yeah. Yeah, so one thing, and that's the third hypothesis I think that you could make, because you had one and two and I have three actually, and we talked about this briefly over lunch, right? So when I remember, like the very first behavioral studies that looked at whether people behaviorally actually um, chunk words into phrases in line with these trees that you're drawing. Yeah? And that's Miller and Chomsky from the early 60s, I think, and then Lefeld in the 70s. They, they checked for the subjects whether they really end a chunk at the position that government and binding, for instance, would predict. Mm -hmm. And that's actually not true for every single individual. Yeah. yeah. Most of them do this, right? They say, okay, noun phrase end, I'm going to chunk this into memory and have some higher level representation, then I'm gonna start the next, next chunk, right? So could it be that what you see there is actually inter-individual variance in the grammars that people have in their heads? Right, um, so we, it could be, 
definitely. Uh, it could also be that in some very rare cases, um, participants are trying to extend what is obviously in front of them and will try perhaps to integrate uh, over the four words or over the five words. And in that case, that can create uh, um, inter-trial inter 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 variability even. Yeah. So um, what I, I can say is that the sentence rhythm is there in every participant. The harmonics are not in every participant. So um, this, is, this is an interesting finding. Um, but I don't know Lars, whether that's... Lars, the, why do you think that a cross-subject variation will be uh, represented in harmonic structure? Because when I chunk at a different frequency, because I have a different memory span or whatever, or I've learned, acquired a different grammar because my parents spoke differently when I was a baby, right? Then I would show, I don't want to call it Zentraiman, I would show like projection of structure at a different frequency. That's okay, but why in harmonic relationship? Because that's maybe just the size of the, I'm making this up, right? But maybe this is just the size of the chunk that people are using then. We're going right? to continue this discussion offline in the coffee break that's coming up and we have one more question. Um, I was just asking Nai, but I, it's a sort of a global question whether um, you would predict the same kind of signature if he, you have internal vocalization and whether uh, for building the structure. Uh, and the second part actually is whether if you look at the beginning and at the end of a repetition period, you see a decrease or an increase in your power response. So uh, I'll start with the second one. Um, there is a difference between the onset sentence and the rest of the sentences for each trial. Uh, but um, if I look at the in each individual sentence, that it's not a difference in where the peak is, but it's just different in, in uh, energy, uh, normalized magnitude power. So it, it, it's, it's, uh, it's meaningful because it's the beginning and it starts from silence, so uh, it wakes up the system. Uh, and then the rest are almost uh, the same. Like it goes immediately, like I mean, perhaps it's just repetition expression, it goes too, too low. But it's interesting, it's a repetition expression of a, something that looks like a, a sentence rhythm. So that's. that's I mean, it's, it's just you would expect the opposite. So if, if you have only repetition yeah. suppression yeah. or whether you build right away the peak response, right? It would actually be more impressive if, if you had this yeah, in yeah, this yeah. context than the other case where you would have a build up. To yeah, I agree with you. The, uh, yeah. Sort of it just goes to, to a certain level and stays there after the second, yeah. Mm. And for the first one, I don't the remember. The first one is the internal vocalization. Like, would you predict the same kind of response if participants over the course of the experiment were starting to vocalize the chunking? Uh, vocal vocalizing internally? Internal, yeah. Internal. Uh, okay. Um, I think... Uh, I don't know. I guess that if they are vocalizing internally, they have to, to, to build up and track uh, you mean repeating internally what they are hearing, something like that? Yeah. So I think they would be, uh, there would be a lag in time, and uh, I guess they would have to do actually. Uh, that's really pretty interesting. They would have to do uh, a build up, uh, at least um, from a from a lexical level. Uh, that is uh, because all words are new and all, all sentences are different. So that may actually. Uh, um, uh, wake up some more um, online building um, mechanism. We could try it. It's a good idea. Okay, let's thank the speaker and get some coffee. <laughs>